Good, uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, special evening um, in which we'll hear from our speaker from Daniel Greenberg, CB, Companion of the Order of the Bath, on the uh, topic of pressure on Parliament. Um, firstly, before I say anything else, muzzle off to you, uh, Daniel, on your recent honour. And I think I saw um, Julia also there somewhere in the background. So uh, muzzle off to uh, muzzle off to uh, both of you, uh, both of you, on this uh, achievement. I think uh, I really speak on behalf of the community and myself in saying how uh, proud we are um, of you. I know uh, you weren't keen for too much of a fuss to be made about that, and uh, in fact, were slightly uncomfortable with uh, an evening focused on yourself. Um, but we really appreciate you uh, you speaking to us and sharing about some of your experiences, which I think uh, will prove very fascinating. Um, you mentioned to me that this session is going head to head with uh, David Attenborough this evening. Um, but I think that politicians make far more interesting wildlife than uh, lions and donkeys. And uh, I think what we hear from you will be uh, will truly be interesting. Um, if I can judge by the conversations we have, this is going to be fascinating. I should share with the community that um, Daniel has been very, very helpful uh, to us as a community and to me personally in, um, in making our decisions and understanding some of the really complicated legal formulations and uh, government guidelines and rules, which aren't always simple to understand. And uh, I hope, Daniel, this isn't a breach of confidence. If, I, um, if you'll excuse me, I transcribed part of your last message to me. And for the edification of the audience, I will share it with you. And it went as follows. Paragraph six, subparagraph three, sub subparagraph F2 of schedule 3A. Um, so these are the sorts of uh, fascinating recordings that Daniel sometimes leaves, <laughs> leaves for me. Um, but not all our conversations are like that. We also have a lot of fun together and I'm sure this evening will, uh, will be brilliant. Um, Daniel is a lawyer specializing in legislation and the legislative process um, with I think 30 years in the private and public sectors dealing with legislation. Um, you are, or are a parliamentary council. I'm not quite sure what that means and perhaps you'll explain that to us for um, a couple of, for 20 years and now an office in the House of Commons. Um, also a, a writer, a trainer and an advisor involved in the um, drafting of legislation. Um, I think you lecture on the statutory interpretation and legislative drafting, and uh, your publishing activities include uh, editor of Oxford University Press Statute Law Review, editor of two legal dictionaries, and a contributor to the Oxford English Dictionary. So uh, um, a lot of uh, work and uh, insight and depth in the field of uh, law. Um, I think we all saw the clip, and uh, I'm sure you will cringe as I mention this, but your recent mention by Rhys Mogg in Parliament, who described you as one of the cleverest people he knows. Um, I think a lot of people nodded their heads when they saw that uh, clip. So, uh, Daniel, sorry for embarrassing you, but uh, we really, as I say, as a community, are, are delighted to have you here speaking to us and looking forward to hearing um, from you. So, uh, without further ado, I am going to hand over to you. The format for the evening is that Daniel will speak on uh, pressures on Parliament for I think some 20, 25 minutes or so, um, after which uh, the floor really will be open to, uh, to all of us, to all of you. So please use the uh, chat function um, if you want to pose a question or uh, use the opportunity to unmute yourselves and uh, ask questions directly, or you can do so via the chat function and I will uh, pass the questions on. Um, but Daniel, without further introduction, thank you so much again, and uh, you should be unmuted at this point, yes. so. Uh, the floor is yours. Well, Zobin, thank you very much indeed. Good evening, everybody. Um, so what I will do in accordance with Rabbi Zobin's request is I will spend just a couple of minutes um, explaining what exactly I do and how I came to do it. And then I'm going to talk about three things that I think ought to be of particular interest to the Jewish community. I'm going to talk about the Northern Ireland peace process as I was involved in it 25 years or so ago. Um, I'm going to talk about the Hunting Act, which is of obvious and clear relevance to the Jewish community, um, perhaps in ways that I'll come to later. And then I'm going to finish by talking about the pressures that Parliament has come under and the rule of law has come under in this country during the last year as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. So just to recap very briefly on what I do and how I got to do it. Um, I joined public service very early on, having taken the view during pupillage that I was unlikely to survive in private practice. 
and um, I think later events have shown me that was a very wise decision. The public service in those days as it is now is a relatively forgiving and nurturing um, environment. And I certainly found as soon as I joined it, I was surrounded by people who were determined to make the best of me, which is uh, which was an amazing experience and immediately makes you feel you want to perform better and better. And now that I've been in the public service for around 30 years, I take great pleasure in thinking that it's now my turn to do a little bit of that back for people who are starting out um, at the younger end of the service. And um, I started in something called the Lord Chancellor's Department, which doesn't exist anymore, but it was great. It was a tiny little office, and we controlled the legal system. And by we, I mean we. Ministers in those days didn't really get involved in very much except what we wanted them to get involved in. And our minister, the Lord Chancellor, was a great expert in the legal system. So it was a fantastic symbiosis of politics and uh, administrative experience. And the administrative decisions were in the hands of lawyers. These days we're a bit we're a bit suspicious of allowing the public administration to be run by people who actually understand anything about the things they're administering. We like to have pure administrators. And in those days it wasn't like that. The lawyers ran the law, the doctors ran the health, and you might say, ladies and gentlemen, that that was not necessarily a bad thing. I, I would prefer not to comment. Um, so. I spent three years there, and then I joined something called Parliamentary Council, and we wrote Acts of Parliament. And the great thing about that is Acts of Parliament cover everything. There is probably no area of the law that I didn't have an opportunity in the next 20 years to get involved in. And I will talk about the Northern Ireland peace process, because I think that was the most, um, that was probably the most important thing that I was involved in and I'll come back to why I think so. But from criminal law, tax law, family law, I worked with uh, the late and much lamented uh, Rabbi Lord Jakovovitz, Zeich Tzadik Divrocha. I worked with him on the uh, amendments to the bill dealing with Itin and preventing Itin from becoming a, um, a tool for um, oppression of women. Um, I, I always regarded that amendment as a failure for the Jewish community, not a success, because it was a failure of self-regulation and we were having to turn to the courts, the secular courts and the secular parliament to mend our failures to regulate ourselves. So I never regarded it as a great success, but it needed to be done and we did it. And to that extent, I was very delighted to be able to play a part in assisting the chief rabbi in that way. Um, so there's virtually nothing I can think of that I didn't have an opportunity to get involved in. And that was enormously exciting. That's another difference, I think, between the public sector and the private sector. Inevitably, the private sector tends towards uh, specialization and the public sector still retains uh, uh, an opportunity to be quite generous, which is, for those of us who like to have a broad view of things is, is great. And I did that for about 20 years and then I left and I divided my time for a little while um, between Rabbi Zobin, I hope this is what you wanted. I'm, 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 I'm sort of set for the night now, so I hope this is what you wanted. This is absolutely spot on there, Daniel. <laughs> Good. Uh, do feel free to kick me electronically if it isn't. And for a few years, I divided my time between the public sector and a little glimpse of the private sector, which was great fun. And in the course of that, I, I, the private sector, I started a little sideline in education and religious law. I acquired uh, diverse clients from the Plymouth Brethren to the Satmar Hasidish community and some other Hasidish communities in Stamford Hill, um, both of whom both of which extremes of the religious spectrum I seem to have retained because um, possibly for linguistic reasons, they don't seem to be able to understand the words, I don't do private work anymore. So they still phone me anyway. Um, and that, 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 that certainly adds a certain spice to the diet. It is quite interesting, of course, what we do and don't share with other religious communities. And the 
the, the, the comparisons and the differences between an extreme Christian community, the Plymouth Brethren, and an extreme religious Jewish community, I, I found and, and find uh, quite fascinating. Um, we, we share quite a lot, but we also have quite a lot of um, different uh, approaches to different, to different things. So I, I played with a sort of dual role for a while, and then in 2016, I settled down again in the public service as the Council for Domestic Legislation in the House of Commons. And what I do there is I am responsible for the scrutiny of legislation by Parliament, primarily in relation to subordinate legislation and certain special kinds of general acts of Parliament, but there's a sort of tension always between parliament and government. That's part of the separation of powers in a rule of law country. Government, parliament and the judiciary are a creative, constant creative tension. And my role is to facilitate parliament in its legal role in keeping that tension going, keeping the scrutiny of the government's legislation, particularly in relation to um, new items of subordinate legislation, private legislation, acts of parliament, and certain other particular kinds of legislation. And I also get, um, somebody's very kindly said, what does subordinate legislation mean? It, it's things like regulation, statutory instruments, the sort of thing you hear about in coronavirus regulations, that's an example of subordinate legislation and that we have particular control of because of course ministers have nothing else to control them if parliament doesn't scrutinize and ensure that they're operating with the powers they were given, then things get out of hand very rapidly. And when I took the job in 2016, it was agreed that I could carry on, as well as that, I could carry on an international and national um, advisory drafting and training practice. And that's a particular delight because it means I get to go around the world, nowadays more remotely than physically, but I get to travel around the world helping people maintain the rule of law. I've done democratization work in Malaysia, in Myanmar, in Sri Lanka, in the Solomon Islands, in, 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 in a, a large number of different places where the rule of law is often very fragile. And that is something that I will come back to when I get to the coronavirus. I don't think we realize how fragile the rule of law is. Americans realize it this week. They may not have realized it two weeks ago, but when they saw that they were half an hour and a little bit of a question of who commands the security officers in the capital away from being a former democracy, I think they saw very clearly how fragile the rule of law is. We haven't got quite, we've never come quite as close as that, but that's part of our problem. We've all grown up in a wonderful rule of law world and we assume it's just going to carry on forever. We, we assume we can push it as much as we like because there will always be the police in charge and parliament in charge. And Mr. Speaker will always be sitting on, on the, 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 the chair. And it is very fragile. And I found it a privilege to be involved in areas in the world where it is constantly fragile and where they welcome help in maintaining it. So that I think brings me to the um, Northern Ireland peace process. And I was working with the then first parliamentary council, um, Sir Christopher Jenkins, head of the office at the time, uh, someone who I formed a very close bond with. And I think it's fair to say, I mean, um, my children, uh, we, we used to go and stay with them. My children had a close relationship with, with him and his wife, and we maintain that relationship to this day. And he, as the head of the office, was in charge of the most politically sensitive and important piece of legislation. And I, as his devil, as it's called, as the assistant to, to the, to the, the um, barrister's assistant, used to be called a devil. So I, as, as the head of the office's devil, became responsible for handling quite a lot 
of the um, of the legislation. And after a while, for various reasons, I sort of took over large chunks of it, which was um, which was challenging. It was quite frightening at times, and it remains one of the most satisfying things that I've done. And of course, I then had the, the pleasure of working with the new Northern Ireland Assembly, and I still, to this day, I work with Stormont, helping them to develop the powers they had. Now, I'll tell you why I think that matters to the Jewish community. The Northern Ireland um, peace process and the Good Friday Agreement legislation should matter to the Jewish community because any time anybody says to you, we will never have peace in the Middle East, it is not possible, it's just nonsense. It's something that will never happen. You can say to them, politics is where the impossible happens regularly. Northern Ireland peace was impossible. When we set out, everybody was very clear. If you think you're going to get the IRA to decommission even a single rifle, never mind machine guns, you're naive, it's ridiculous, it's impossible. It's just not going to happen. And a year later, a very brave American general was standing on a boat somewhere in the middle of the sea, watching with a clipboard while members of the, uh, the, armed, the armed wing of Sinn Féin threw, as he, clipped, as he ticked them off on his clipboard, threw machine guns, impossible machine guns, into the impossible sea. It wasn't complete decommissioning, of course it was, and we never thought it was, we never thought it was going to. It was symbolic, but it was a, a symbolism that brought peace to Northern Ireland. And when I stood a few years ago for the first time at, a, at an Oxford conference, talking about what I remembered uh, of the peace process, and there were youngsters there sitting, taking notes, and some of these were from Ireland, some of them from America, some of them Ireland. And I realized they were taking notes about a historical problem that they couldn't imagine. And I thought that was amazing. That was what we achieved. We changed, we, we brought about the impossible. And by the way, the heroes of that were not the heroes that you see of, right? The, 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 the prime ministers who come in after it's all over and sign the thing and take all the credit. I'll tell you who the two biggest heroes were. Some of you will remember the name, some of you won't. Mo Molan and Paddy Mayhew. Mo Molan was the Labour uh, Secretary, of, uh, Shadow Secretary from Northern Ireland, and Paddy Mayhew, Sir Patrick Mayhew, was the Attorney General and asked for demotion. He asked John Major to demote him so that he could be in charge of the, of the uh, Northern Ireland peace process legislation. And I remember him saying to me one, one night, very, you talk about the corridors of power, you know, this was, this was a real smoke-filled room somewhere up in the, in the, the, the corridors, and um, we were relaxing from our labours. And he said to me, Daniel, do you know why I chose to, to take this ministerial poisoned chance? And I said, no. And he said, because I grew up hearing the phrase, the black and tan. This is a, a very emotive, sectarian piece of, of, um, of Irish, uh, Northern Irish um, uh, symbolism. And he said, I wanted, I wanted the children not to grow up like that anymore. I wanted the children not to grow up constantly who's, who's on which side of the divide. And we literally, I remember, and this, this gives me great, um, I, I get sort of great, um, was uh, veracity when I go to uh, Northern Ireland. They, li they, they listen when I am able to tell them by way of background that I remember sitting on the chair behind the speaker's chair, sat in the corridor, literally with a piece of paper like this, with Paddy Mayhew on that side, Mo Molan on that side, literally trying, how about that? Could you sell that to them? How about that? Could you sell that to them? And that was how we forged the legislation that gave that, that, that gave um, legs and power to the Good Friday Agreement itself. And if we could achieve that, anybody can achieve peace anywhere in the world. It was impossible, 
And yes, of course, the peace was very fragile. Yes, OK, we've had a blip. We were without the Northern Ireland Assembly for three years recently, but it's back up because we created something that created a void that can then be filled. And I would like to think that the Northern Ireland peace process, with it, yes, we let terrorists out of prison and families of victims had to confront their loss all over again. Families of victims had to be brave enough to look for the, for, for the future good of their children their, or their neighbors' children, their, their broader families, to look to that as being more important than nursing that, that, than nursing the hurts, the real hurts of former times. And that required enormous courage. People who really wanted to move, move forward. And I've done work in Northern Ireland since then, um, dealing with, with um, pensions or victims of the troubles. And I've sat in a room with people from both sides joined together finally by a sense of having surmounted their personal problems and achieved together things that everybody said were impossible. So I, I won't go on any more about the Northern Ireland um, Northern Ireland experience. I will just say one thing. Um, there was a there was a halachic um, implication of it because of course the Good Friday Agreement uh, crystallised over, over Pesach. Easter and Pesach um, coincided quite um, specifically that year. And I was quite heavily involved in the specifics of the legislation at that time. I'd more or less taken over two big chunks. So I asked Rabbi Kupa, Zechit Tzadik Livrocho, what to do about attending um, Whitehall and Westminster over Yom Tov. And he said, this is Pikuach Nefesh. He ruled, it was Pikuach Nefesh directly what I was doing. He listened to what I was needed for and you know, who would take over and how they would take over if I wasn't there at all. And he ruled it was Pikuach Nefesh. And he, he ruled I could have a car to take me in and home over Yontif. In the end, I didn't. I decided to walk backwards and forwards from here to Whitehall because I thought that would at least give me some some zeicher that it was yomt. So that's what we did. And Julia had to cope with uh, a couple of sodorium and and, uh, and a, a few other meals and things um, without without um, without me being there. And I think we we all felt um, that we we all felt it was a privilege to be able to put ourselves out a little bit for the sake of real real peace in a place that hadn't known it, which is. Um, something that 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 we we all value, and Jews value peace. And I do think we can remind ourselves when people tell us what is impossible and what is unrealistic. We know that impossible things can happen all the time. Um, I was in something about it. I'm going to move on because I haven't left myself much time. I'm going to talk about the hunting act very quickly. Um, the, 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 the Hunting Act, we're moving from the terribly important to the apparently trivial. But I don't think it was very trivial. I actually think it was quite an important um, and troubling episode. I gave the, uh, this year I gave the annual uh, dinner lecture to the RS Surtees Society, which is a learned society that's dedicated to the publishing of the works of RS Surtees, and it maintains an interest at a uh, social level in fox hunting. And I gave a talk to them, I'm a member of the RS30 Society, and I gave a talk to them entitled, First They Came to the Hunt. And what I said was, the Hunting Act was, it troubled me at the time, because it was effectively a piece of, a piece of class warfare masquerading as a piece of animal welfare legislation. It wasn't animal welfare. Nobody really cared anything about foxes or hounds or anything else. If they had done, 
we would have had a completely different shape for the legislation. As it is, the legislation is more or less unenforceable, and it was never it was never really expected to be anything other than. It was about Tony Banks in particular, a Labour backbencher, thumbing his nose at the aristocracy who ride, who, who you know, put on pink coats and, and ride after, after, uh, after foxes on horseback. And the chamber divided on class lines, not on. And what troubled me about that, uh, I mean, I have no difficulty with banning hunting. The uh, Noidi Behuda rules that it is, in some cases, it can be, if it's the genuine uh, pest control, it's mutter. Uh, for me, it would not be genuine pest control. I don't have a lot of need to keep down the foxes on the estate of the Greenbergs. So I'm quite clear. It would be awesome for me, Mishun Tsavali Chaim, fox hunt be awesome to me. Why do I care? I care because in a rule of law country, I'm very uncomfortable about a majority in the House of Commons at any one time turning round and saying, let's take a view on a moral matter, what the consensus is in this chamber, and, let's, and then let's enforce that, let's impose that moral view on the whole of the rest of the country. And that troubles me because and when I go to when I go abroad, very often the most difficult thing I have to do is to explain to people the difference between a parliamentary democracy and a parliamentary dictatorship. A parliamentary dictatorship is whoever's in the majority at any one time can do whatever it likes and everybody else has to suffer. A parliamentary democracy is about respecting and protecting minorities. That is the point of a large part of our parliamentary process, our parliamentary system. It's about ensuring that minorities get to exert their influence and feel protected and cherished and respected. That is the difference between a democracy and a dictatorship in a parliamentary system. And so it troubled me that on a matter on which it is possible to have different moral opinions. It is possible to be against fox hunting and it is possible to be for fox hunting and remain a decent human being. And it troubled me that effectively a moral majority for the time being of the House of Commons was turning around and saying, we are drawing the line in the sand of animal welfare here. Anybody on this side is not a decent human being anybody in this side is. And of course, on this occasion, the direct relevance for us as the jury is obvious. At what point may the present, the, the inhabitants at any one time of the House of Commons decide to address child abuse and draw a line in the sand on one side or other of which will be Brismid. And again, if we do not foster a democracy in which minority views are cherished and respected because of their minority, not in spite of their minority, sooner or later, we will suffer personally, but to my mind, we already have lost long before then, because we will have lost what, we will have lost what, um, what matters by stepping out of the very cherished, liberal, Malchus Chelchese, which is represented by a, um, by a rule of law. Um, finally, if I may, just, just for a couple of minutes, let me talk about the, the, the issue of the pressure on Parliament as a result of COVID, and then I will stop and, and uh, by any question. The big problem is, in the last year, we have habituated a large number of people who had never before even dreamt of breaking the law or disrespecting them. We have habituated them to think of the law as a bit hard. And that is very, very dangerous. Now, to some extent, it was inevitable. It was inevitable partly because that is the nature of 
public health emergency legislation, and partly because it is no secret, and the government wouldn't make any bones about it, the government has made inevitably mistakes along the way because they had to learn incredibly fast, the pressures on the legislation were immense, and many of the government lawyers who did, who may have come up with a final product that wasn't always great, did an incredible job to come up with anything at all. So this isn't, this isn't a criticism of anybody within government, and it isn't criticism of government, but it is a serious, it is a serious trouble that I have as the more durable legacy of the COVID pandemic will be a different relationship between many people in this country and the law that protects that rule of law within which we all live. I would like to think we could get back to a situation where people, where, where people um, no longer question the law, no longer think about, well, I might just break this law a little bit. I would like to think we could get back to that, but I'm nervous. I'm, I'm nervous that it's a habit, that once you've broken the habit of unquestioning a law, of, uh, abiding by the law, observing the law, very, very difficult to get back to a, to, to a situation where people obey the law on principle, whether or not they agree with it. I could talk about some of the um, mechanics of how I think that's developed. I'm not going to, to I, I, I've used the time that I was encouraged to take in, in, in a polemic, so I shall stop and, and take questions now. But, but I, just to make one point, if I may, I think if I, if I were to say one area where the government has gone wrong, and I'm not saying this on my own back, this is something that the reports of the Joint Committee on Statutory Instruments that I uh, serve has, has, uh, has published, something that I think could now be improved upon, which is why we have published that effect. And that is the distinction between guidance and regulations. Rabbi Zobin mentioned before that, um, that he and I have had many a discussion as he battles so uh, valiantly, and if I may say so, impressively and successfully to serve the Kehillah in these unprecedented times and to maintain a safe and active shul for all of us, which is something for, for which we are enormously indebted to him and his wonderful Gaboim for. And he and I have had discussions that very often have centered around, yes, but that's the law, now there's the guidance. And yes, but does the guidance mean? That? And the problem is, it has not always been properly explained to the public what is law and what is guidance, where one starts, where one finishes. And that it is that that has led to genuine confusion and confusion leads to people with the best will in the world no longer knowing what the law is. They don't know, am I allowed to go to shul this morning? Am I allowed to, but advised against it? What does it mean advised against it? Advised by who? You know, Michael Dove tells me how, to, how many times to go for a walk and when to go to bed. Am I meant to obey him? What is it, what, what's the basis for that? And the government have not been able to be sufficiently clear to the public about that distinction. I think, in, I think re-establishing that distinction is our safest way back to a rule of law society where people no longer have any doubt they must keep the law because the law, uh, because without the law, as the as we say in the obvious, people will tear each other apart without any let or hindrance. So hopefully we can tighten up on that in the next few weeks. Hopefully the government will be able to retrench a little bit on that. And that will, I hope, restore a bit of clarity and faith in and respect for the rule of law. I've overstayed my, my, my electronic welcome so far as the monologue is concerned, so I will stop there and I very much welcome any questions. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. That was um, absolutely fascinating and um, illuminating. I, I hadn't understood much of your work and uh, what you were doing and uh, to hear about it and uh, understand it and uh, um, hear some of the perspectives, including the relevance of uh, Northern Ireland and fox hunting to us as a community was 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 truly enlightening. Thank you so much. Um, 
there are quite a few questions coming through on the chat. Some uh, put through to everyone and uh, you'll be able to see them also and some uh, sent directly to me. Um, but a couple of questions have come through um, linking your comments around uh, fox hunting and parliamentary dictatorship to what's going on with COVID. So the two, the last two points really that you addressed are clearly uh, resonating and touching a nerve. Um, someone asked, um, has, um, has the government not been um, imposing its standards um, uh, on people? Hasn't we become a parliamentary dictatorship with the emergency legislation that's going on? Um, how can we extricate uh, ourselves from that as a country? Someone else asked about um, how you relate to that when it's interfering with um, yeshivas and kodalim and shuls and what they're able to do. Um, so actually, how do you draw the line? I mean, surely the government's always, it, surely its job is to make decisions about morality and to the, make uh, um, illegal things which we view as uh, as immoral. Um, so what, what exactly is the line around that? And, and can you help us understand that a little bit better? Uh, yeah, I can try. Um, I think the the distinction, and I accept that it isn't a completely, it isn't always a, a completely clear distinction. Um, and I saw questions about euthanasia, which we might come back to, but let's stick with COVID for now. The broad distinction, the broad distinction is between public policy and morality. Morality is what each person decides for herself or himself as a good way to behave. It's about personal, moral, humanist, spiritual, however you want to look about and look at it, about personal, personal attainment. Public policy is much more boring. It's about keeping the country safe and keeping the country solvent. And those are the two primary duties of any government. To keep the people safe in every respect, that means safe from all kinds of threat, including in this case from uh, virus threat, from medical threat, but from terrorism, from warfare, from insurrection, that is the government's first responsibility. The second responsibility is well-being, welfare, economic welfare well-being in the broader sense. And the problem with COVID is that those two primary responsibilities have conflicted in such a difficult way for the government to set a balance down the middle. Inevitably, because it's, it, it, it has, um, it's changed all the time, it's fluctuated. The balance has moved from day to day and people have been very frustrated. One minute, the prime minister says, I guarantee this isn't going to happen. The next minute he says, sorry, it is going to happen. Well, that's fine, because day one, he said, with the present circumstances, I am not going to close gyms. Day two, we've got a different set of circumstances. I am going to close gyms. And of course, that has been immensely frustrating. But it's within the government's, not just the government's powers, it's within the government's duty. The first duty of the government confronted with a pandemic is to protect the National Health Service so that the expected projected numbers of people will be able to be dealt with in the hospitals. And if that means we cause unprecedented economic damage, the, poli the public policy of the government is that what money, what, 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 what money can make, money can mend, and that this is the policy. I'm not saying they necessarily will achieve it in the way everybody likes or, in, or achieve it in the way they like, but this is the policy. You look after health first and you deal with other with economic well being through repair packages second. And that is the order of priority. That's not morality. That is a legitimate public policy decision for the government to take. And we are bound by our rule of law social contract to respect those decisions. Whether we agree with them or not, whether we would draw them in the same line, this line in the same place or not, that is public policy, not personal morale. Thank you. Um, if I may, sorry, 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 sorry to, to do this, but of course, personality comes back in. If the government say, 
um, we are now not going to, for, to prohibit places of worship. You can open places of worship again. Morality comes back in. You, Rabbi Zobin and Rabbi now have to decide, but as a matter of moral principle, are we going to carry, even though we're allowed to go, are we going to go, and how are we going to ensure that we, that, that we go in the right way? Uh, thank you, and I, I understand that distinction. Um, we've had a few questions here around um, uh, Brexit, and, and perhaps forgive me if I bundle some of them together. They, they, uh, they're semi-linked. Um, one question read, um, uh, um, fascinating hearing your comments about uh, your part in Northern Ireland and absolutely salute your role and um, the, the saving of lives that clearly this um, achieved. Um, but at the time of drafting the legislation, was it clear that that would create a paradox in terms of Britain's relationship with Europe um, and would create the consequence of either needing a border between the North and the Republic or Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK um, resulting in the, uh, the subsequent debate about how to resolve this in, in terms of Brexit. Um, so that's one question. Um, and then two other questions really linked to other points you made. The first one was, would you regard the Brexit process as an example of a parliamentary dictatorship rather than democracy? And finally, um, do you think our constitution is in need of reform? Did the paralysis over Brexit demonstrate that, uh, that something has gone badly wrong with, uh, with how the systems work? So um, a question about whether you foresaw the consequences when the Northern Ireland legislation was framed, and then in general, how you view the Brexit process and, and the constitutional paralysis. Um, so I, I, I do not accept, I never have done, and I've given opinions about this in the last year or so, I do not accept that we created with the with the Good Friday Agreement, we created any kind of inherent conflict between the status of Northern Ireland as part of the United Kingdom and the status of Northern Ireland as a constructive and beneficial partner on the island of Ireland with the Republic. On the contrary, I actually think that in the Northern Ireland legislation, back in 1998, we created the very mechanisms with the Joint Ministerial Council, again, impossible years before, we created the mechanisms that could have been used had the political will been there to use them. They could have been used to soften the present problems in relation to Brexit rather than to, um, to, to accentuate them. So I, I, I do not at all accept that the problem arose um, arose in uh, what we did in 1995 to 1998. But I think the problem arises from the second question you asked. Um, was Brexit in question of, uh, of parliamentary dictatorship rather than democracy? Well, uh, what I would say is the essence of the decision was not. It is a matter of public policy, whether or not we whether or not the United Kingdom is part of the European Union. But I think the way that both sides, both political sides, spoke and behaved before and after the referendum has resonated very much of identifying why everybody else is wrong and telling them what they jolly well ought to do and think. And I think that is why it has been such a such a painful process, because, and again, I don't I don't say this as a criticism of any particular group in 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 politics or in official. I say it as an observation on the overall flavour of the debate, and the flavour of the debate remains rancorous to this very day. It remains a flavor of um, identifying the stupidity of the other side, whichever side you're on, and not trying to learn from the issues that the other side has identified and trying to make the best of whichever side of the line the public policy decision came down. So that is where the problem is. And Northern Ireland, and what we're seeing now at the courts, these are the, the, these are 
these are a product of people on both sides of the channel, on both sides of the Irish Sea, for all sorts of different reasons, not wanting to make it work. And if you don't want to make it work, it's, it's, it's the corollary of what I said this, the, the, the earlier. Northern Ireland shows anything, the impossible can be achieved overnight if you want it. Brexit has showed the possible can be made a mess of if you want to make a mess of it. And I would come back to your last question on that. I would say constitutional reform. Well, I think it's all worked brilliantly. I think it's been great. We've had pretty much chaos. And chaos is great because the alternative to chaos is stability in one group's favour. And then you're straight back to entrenched dictatorships, to entrenched interests. We got through, everybody said with the laughing stock of the world during the, the end of the Theresa May government, with a, with, a, with a parliament that couldn't make decisions, that couldn't move. Well, yes, we were the laughing stock of some parts of the world, but we were also, as always, the admiration of some parts of the world who thought, well, in the end, they sort of find a way around, and it may be a chaotic way around, it may be rather a, they make it up as they go along. Here is a constitution that is constantly made up as it goes along, but I think that's rather a good thing. We are a flexible constitution, and we are therefore able always to ensure that all the different dissonances that need to be balanced are being balanced. Thank you. Um, maybe one more question on this line and then uh, move on to slightly other topics. Um, a question about the government proposing to break the law, um, albeit in a specific and limited way, and what you as a, a person who's really dedicated your career to law, you're a believer in law, you clearly believe in the power of law to improve society. Um, it, 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 what do you make of that? Isn't that terribly corrosive, uh, perhaps even more corrosive than the breaching of corona regulations? And, and what's the man on the street meant to make of that when uh, we see the government itself perhaps uh, misusing law? Yeah, I mean, being a little bit careful what I say about that, I never really understood that because I never really felt that that was what the government was actually proposing to do. I know that at one stage, a minister pretty much said that, did say that, um, and I never really understood why the government didn't, didn't say, well, actually, that's not exactly what's going on. What I understood, and I, I, I won't go on about this, partly because I need to be careful what I say, and partly because it really is extremely boring if I go on about it too long. Um, but, but, but what I understood was that we were taking powers that could be used to react to what we saw as a wrong, into a potential wrong interpretation and operation of a previously entered into international agreement. I don't think the government ever said we're proposing to tear up the agreement. I think some of the rhetoric was, un was unfortunate and I, uh, I agree with the tenor of the question that I think it did leave a puzzled taste in many people's minds, which I think we could have avoided by slightly greater clarity about what was what, what, what was actually going on. So it didn't bother me personally because I didn't actually think we were about to break international law despite some of what was said, but I do accept why, I can see why it did worry a number of people. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions, uh, and you did touch on this a little bit when you spoke, um, about being a, a from Jew in um, the corridors of power, being a visibly from Jew, um, I think you, you always, from what I've seen of the images, you're always wearing your, your kippah, always wearing your couple at work, um, very visibly so. Um, how have you found that? Have you ever experienced uh, anti-Semitism in your work? Have you ever felt that this has been a positive, uh, given you a positive interaction with, with the people that you're dealing with? What, what's your experience of, of balancing your from life and uh, your career? In 33 years or so, I've encountered a fair amount of anti-Semitism almost entirely exclusively from Jews, as you would expect. Non-Jews very rarely um, are, are very rarely anti-Semitic. They don't really need to be because we do such a good job of, of annoying each other and driving each other mad that, that they don't really need to, to help us very much. Um, on two occasions, in corridors in the House of Lords, I was asked to take my kippah off or told that this wasn't the way we do things. And each occasion, of course, it was a 
of course. What you know, what 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 would what would one expect? Anything else? Um, I did encounter I did encounter some Jewish antipathy that I had a lot of sensitivity for. Because in two cases, I won't obviously name names, but there was one very senior judge and one very senior cabinet minister, both of whom had uh, both of whom had married out, and each of whom felt very bruised by their treatment. Maybe it may have been in their minds, it may not have been in their minds, but they felt very bruised by the treatment they'd had from their co-religionists. And that did come out in quite a strong antipathy in both cases, quite a strong antipathy to the community. And I felt at the time, these, these were both, well, actually one of them I think was a particularly decent person, the other politician, but, but uh, but you know, in, in both cases, I thought there was something, it gave me pause for thought as to how sensitive we are, as, a, as, as you say, Rabbi Zayden, we're very visible, how sensitive are we are to those of our community or on the, the edges of our community who may be less visible and for that very reason may feel, may feel that we don't have their best interests in the heart, we don't love them as much as we actually do, so I think we, we, we have to, to um, perhaps do a bit of nach besod or achein of nach kaira on that. Um, real anti-Semitism from the outside, joking side, I've encountered very little. Um, and I think on the whole, we, we still live in, not just still, I think in some ways increasingly, we live in a country that is probably one, uh, probably, one of the most extraordinary cases of Malchus Shalchesed that we've had in, in our history. Thank you, and um, thank you for first all these words of, um, I'll call them Musa because they're, they're, they're well received. Um, I think Corona and the recent years has, has brought out divisions in the country at large and um, uh, in, within our own community. And uh, certainly all of us are emerging bruised from these experiences. and for all of us to think how we can get on better with those on the right, those on the left, um, a really important message and thank you for that. Um, a question here which is, is somewhat general but I, I think a very interesting one to ask. Um, lawyers and politicians don't always have the best reputation in terms of um, ethics and how they deal with things and so on. What is your sense of, of the legal class and the politi political class in the country? Um, morality, ethics, competence, you know, I, I think we all watch political satire and legal satire and read about these things. And what's your broad sense about our, uh, the governance and uh, do we have reason for concern or optimism around that area? I think, I think let me take the law first. I think it is a very um, powerful question. I sometimes get youngsters ask me, you know, young, young, particularly Orthodox Jewish people come and ask me you know, how will they manage and in, in, if they want to go into law. And they're normally thinking of Chavez and Kashras and things like that. And I say to them, you know, Chavez and Kashras is really, you know, nowadays, it, it's, it's, it's not an issue at all. It really isn't. Um, they wouldn't be allowed to stop you taking Chavez off. And, you know, the, 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 uh, there is no business dinner in, in the world that can't be supplied by, by kosher food. And then I say to them, I think the pressures will be very different. And I think the biggest pressure surrounding lawyers in private practice is to be Makai Midvar Sheket And I think that is more of a pressure in some areas than it was when I, even when I started in the law relatively recently, just a few decades ago. And I think a number of private lawyers um, struggle to maintain the kind of moral decision-making, the moral, moral high standards that they set themselves in their private lives, some of them struggle to do that in their, in their professional lives. There are ways around that. I think there are parts of the law where there is no difficulty around that. There are parts where it is gonna be a problem and you do well to, to take advice and stay away from some areas of law. Um, we have some fantastic Jewish lawyers. We have, we, we just had a president of the Supreme Court, 
David Neuberger, who is an amazing ambassador for Judaism as, it, as a, he is a yashar, completely straight, decent, honest person whose Judaism very much flavors uh, his, his public, not, not an Orthodox Jew in, in every respect, but his Judaism very much flavors his approach to his public life. And we have beacons like that where youngsters can go into the law and feel that they can only be inspired by these figures. But we also have lawyers who let the side down very well. We have lawyers who, who uh, many of whom uh, masquerade as Orthodox Jews and clearly are. And that does a lot of harm to the community. It does a lot of harm to the law. And of course, it does a lot of harm to the standing of the law and the community in the, in the rest of the world. And we, exactly as you said, Rabbi Zobin, we are visible and therefore we have an achrais. We have a responsibility to set standards and to look for ways of showing that Rav, Rav Jacobovic, Zechit Sadat Bivrochu, I've quoted once already this evening, used to say he doesn't like it when he hears he's from but he's a solicitor or he's a solicitor but he's from. He wants people to feel their professional lives and their private lives are a holistic totality where the profession informs the private and the private informs the profession. And we can definitely inspire, uh, aspire to be inspiring role models of uh, professional ethics that the law can, can achieve when it's done at its best. Um, politicians, I think for various reasons, not the least that we're perhaps mercifully running out of time, I will say very little about, I think recent developments in the House of Lords have not been entirely helpful to the, uh, to the reputation of the political class. And I think that is something that government and others are aware of. The House of Lords as a body is certainly aware of it. And I think that is something that does have to be. Thank you. We are running out of time, but there's, um, forgive me, so many questions coming in. Um, I'll, I'll ask, maybe I'll bundle um, all three in one, and uh, um, I'm sure you'll easily be able to answer each of them in one minute. Um, the first was a, a very beautiful question, actually. Um, it says, Yashikar to you, Daniel, on this great honour, reminiscent of your namesake, the great uh, Daniel. I'm reading what's been written here. Um, how do you think we as citizens, is there anything we as citizens can do to facilitate a, um, a regaining of a trust in law? or to encourage the government to pursue um, improvement and repair in this area. Um, the second question, which no doubt you'll be able to answer in 60 seconds is, um, you reference that it's never impossible to make a peace treaty. With your experience in Northern Ireland, how's that reflect on Israel's inability to find and negotiate peace with the Palestinian? I can't imagine uh, it should take more than 60 seconds to solve the Middle East. <laughs> um, and the final question, which it is it, very briefly, um, what happens when you receive an honor? How do you find out about it and uh, what, what happens there? I, I think um, those of us who haven't yet received honors are interested in this, uh, just to hear a little bit about uh, how you're let known about that. Let me take the middle one first. The Northern Ireland politicians do not love peace in general because it takes their game away. Politicians, their game is to fight with each other. That's what they do. And one of, the biggest, one of the biggest influences on Northern Ireland politics was Mothers for Peace. They came from all sides of the community and they said, enough of our children have died. They were, uh, they were uncomfortably successful so far as some of the politicians were concerned and I'll spare you the details, but that is the answer. Politicians will never stop arguing. It's when the people turn around to the politicians and say, enough people have died, suddenly the politicians can achieve the impossible. And I would say on the first question, I would say the same. All we can do, I would like, I would like us to ensure that when people say, what are Jews like? What is Judaism about? They don't immediately think about Shabbos and Kashrus and Tefillin and things that are irrelevant to the outside world. They think about Yashrus and Besed, which is where Avram or Venus started. If they can identify Judaism with Yashrus 
and, and with Emes and Yashus and Chesed, even if, of course, we will all fail lots of the time to live up to those ideals, but if they can identify those ideals with Judaism, we are playing a part in our, we are playing a part that deserves our place in the Malchus Shul Chesed. And as to when one is when one is given an honor, that's easy to answer. Um, you, you're written to about a month before, um, and that follows about a year, sometimes more, of um, appropriate checks having been made, appropriate discussions having taken place, um, and then it, it's an, and then it's announced a month later. And in due course, obviously, it's been a little bit delayed because of the pandemic, there will Hashem, be an investiture in the palace, at which point, um, uh, in, in my case, I will become a companion of the Order of the Bath. Thank you very much, and, and thank you for a fascinating evening. Um, the biggest compliment I, I can possibly say is um, the texts that I've received from several people saying, please, can we run over the hour? Um, please don't cut them short. Please, let's continue. Um, this has certainly held me enthralled, and, and um, the large number of participants who turned out to hear you is, is a recognition of, of, first of all, the respect um, that we feel towards you, and um, the fact that you held us all for, for over an hour about what, what potentially could have been a dry topic, and it wasn't, it was absolutely <laughs> fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, secondly, I want to echo your, your cry for Yashras. Um, I know that this is something really in the fibre of your being. I know it's something you stand for, it's something you care passionately about. And um, so important for us to, to hear that, to remember those words of our Sisa Yashra Tov, that is what we are meant to do as, as Jews. And um, Thank you for, for calling that. And finally, I just want to conclude with the Pasuk, Tov, Shem, Meshem, and Tov. If Shem and Tov refers to an honor, an external honor, and the recognition that one receives outside, a Shem Tov is even more than that. And, and certainly, um, you are a person with a Shem Tov because of your, your um, pursuit of justice, Sedek, Sedek, Tov. And thank you for being a role model of that. Thank you so much for this fascinating uh, evening and for sharing of your wisdom, insight, and experiences. And thank you to everyone for joining us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rabbi Zerbin. Good night.